the great thinkers of our philosophy. These guys, I would pose today, and I know there are philosoph philosophers in the audience, so please don't get too angry with me. Oh, well, please do, because we'll have an interesting debate. These guys have two points in common. Point number one, they tended to be wrong. Um, and it's not me saying that, because of course they all were really smarter than me. I'm trying to say here that they, write, they wrote books explaining us why the others were wrong. Because you see, they could read each other, and you've got Kant explaining why these two guys were wrong, and you've got Hobbes saying, hey, you know, our real nature is that we are a bunch of bastards. And then there's Kant saying, no, that's not right. We have a moral law inside us. And then there's John Stuart Mill posing something that is similar to something that has been called the homo economicus. First thing in common, these guys were mostly wrong. Second thing in common, the very reason these guys were mostly wrong, I would pose for today, is that their ideas about human nature was, were based in some preconceptions of their time. They were, their ideas about human nature were not exactly based in systematic, empirical experimentation. As a bottom line, as the 19th century closes down, we have an idea that is a prevalent idea in the academia. And the prevalent idea in the academia uh, perhaps has to do with that, with the fact that I have this guy as the last guy here, but who knows. The prevalent idea in the academia is that humans, as Asians, are rational maximizers of self-benefit. That is selfish, if you will. So we have some way to look at the world in which we say, okay, my benefit is this, so my actions are taken in, uh, because I want to get the maximum benefit. Uh, if, I were, if I were an economist, which I'm not, I will be talking here about utility functions and so on and so forth, but essentially we are selfish. And that's an interesting idea because this idea of, of us being rational or selfish of whatever you call it is, is actually something that goes, runs very deep into many of the philosophy but also in uh, uh, philosophical systems, but also under many of the political and economical systems that we are enjoying nowadays. Many of the laws that are pa passed by countries, by, by parliaments, are based on the idea that we, are, we will act rationally, right? The thing is that that's an idea, that's what happened, and the problem the second thing that these guys have, have in common, the fact that they didn't use empirical evidence in a systematic way to get their ideas about human nature, can change. And actually was changed by this guy. Uh, well, sorry, this is rationality. This is my slide for rationality. This was the guy who changed. Okay? I prepared this presentation this afternoon, so it's not, I'm not very familiar with it. Uh, this guy proposed the theory of evolution, that's we all know, but it's really known that in 18, 71, he published another book, The Descent of Man, in which, for the first time, there was a systematic, naturalistic analysis of human nature, comparing many things in our nature, including our behavior, to other organisms, including our closest relatives, the primates. And interestingly enough, uh, one of the things that come out of this book, but also out of other books, is something that to the, to the Naive, the casual observer, would seem contradictory with natural selection because it's something that has nothing to do with the fight for life uh, taken, as I, I insist, in naive terms. It has to do with solidarity. It has to do with helping each other. It has to do with cooperation. And actually, cooperation is something that happens very frequently in nature. There's not as much selfishness, not as much rational behavior to maximize your benefit, as one could assume. You've got wonderful examples of cooperation, of cooperation in nature. That's my favorite one. Vampires, ladies and gentlemen, do exist. And they are not uh, Transylvanian nobles. They are a bunch of uh, mammals that go about flying and sucking blood. And they do. They, by night, they get out of the cave. They go flying slowly. And they see some shepherd or some cow sleeping, and they would beat, bite, sorry, and they would suck some blood. And some of these guys double their weight with the blood they have sucked. 
and they go back to the cave. And in the cave, what happens is that, you see, some of them got lucky and doubled their, their way. They got lots of blood, but others didn't. And then in that cave, one of the most beautiful examples of cooperation happens. Nature is ripe with these beautiful examples. These guys uh, vomit blood into each other, right? Uh, this is not very beautiful, but when you think about it, <laughs> when you think about it, they are sharing, they are sharing food. And actually, it's even more interesting than that because when they share food, they don't share food randomly. The guys who, when lucky, would share with the others tend to get more the nights they don't get lucky. So they, they have some complex system in which they can identify individuals and recognize the behavior of these individuals. I'm posing that this is not exactly rational. This implies stuff. And, 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 he, will, and, and he, will, he will complain a lot. He's already <laughs> mad at me, right? OK, OK, that's good. That's good. We have a debate. Now, nature is full of these examples. And I'm not going to go into detail because I'm already talking too much. You've got fish that clean each other when they should be eating each other. You've got social insects. You've got uh, animals who, who would hunt together and share. You've got primates, of course, humans, of course. And then, of course, every summer, modern humans engage in one of the most sophisticated forms of cooperation. Because we cooperate not because we like it, and with people that we don't even like, we pay your taxes, for God's sake. That's, that's really crazy. So the point is that all this, which perhaps is not necessarily rational, and perhaps is not in our own benefit, can be studied, as Mara was saying, in a systematic way, can be studied in a lab in which you have computers, in which you play games. Pretty much like the game I just explained. And you can measure all, all sorts of interesting things into people when they are playing these games. One of my favorite is the ultimatum game. How does this work? Hey, there's two people, and the experimenter says, you've got money, you split it. That, this does ring a bell, right? Let me say something. If we all were a rational self entity maximum, where do I have my games, the results of my games? Oh, here, thank you. If we all were, if we all were rational self benefit maximizers, then we should, in principle, play in the following way. I've got 10 euros to split with Genoveva or with somebody anonymous. Hey, I give one to you and nine for me. Why not? After all, I have no incentive to, to give you zero, because if I give you zero, you may say no. But if I give you one, you may accept. What do you lose by losing one? Now, in general terms, uh, and so far I have lied a lot, and they are, he's scribbling like crazy. But, but um, in general terms, that would be the predicted behavior, right? But it just so happens that humans don't tend to play like this. We know that humans usually make other offers. Let's, let's make some example here, right? This person didn't offer nine and one. This person offered five and five. This person, somebody else, let's mix this just to avoid. Uh, this person, some person called Baruta, oh, offered eight and two. Or five and two. I hope it's eight and two because five and two doesn't add up to ten. Right? <laughs> <laughs> this other person, anonymous, another five five. This other person, anonymous, another five five. This other person, anonymous, seven three. Hey, what's going on? Why don't we make this, in principle, rational offer that some people said we should be making? There's stories to that. These experiments were run big time in the 80s. It just so happens we just don't, right? And what about rejection? Do we accept anything? Nine and one. Hey, let's have a look. This person here, no name. Again, nobody put the hand, so I cannot give money. This person accept, uh, rejected one or, sorry, zero or one, but accepted anything larger than two. If this person is given two or more, this person accepts. This other person here rejected anything that was not four, or more. This other person here, ah, star, some, we, know who this, you, we know who you are. This person rejected zero, but accepted everything else. This person is rational. But in this case, this person is kind of rational in terms of expectation, but in terms of distribution, it's 5-5. Five, five. <laughs> so you know, this person doesn't treat others as he or she would like to be treated. 
he, this person treats others in, in a more generous way, and so on and so forth. What I'm trying to say here is that all these experiments, and we can discuss a lot about this, show that we are not necessarily rational self-benefit maximizers. We are not busters. We are just the rest of the, like the rest of nature, an organism that tends to cooperate a lot. Interestingly enough, these guys, apparently, according to a paper a few years ago and some further experiments, do behave like la rational self-benefit maximizers. These guys, uh, Giuseppe Cal, Tomasello, and Jensen, have adapted the game we have just played to be played by chimpanzees in the loo, in the zoo of, not in the loo, in the zoo of Leipzig. And, and you know, this guy makes an offer by pushing two trays that are full of bananas, and this guy either rejects by not finishing to push or accepts by finishing pushing. And of course the results are disputable and there's plenty of papers, but in principle here, when this guy finishes pushing, pushing they both can get. If this guy doesn't push, they cannot get because the, the, it's not close enough. When you do this with, with Bonabas, you observe that the tendency to do minimal offers and to accept anything, which would be more or less the rational thing to do, these guys do. So interestingly and shockingly, what Thomas Aquinas or John Stuart Mill or Aristotle would have perhaps said that was the rational behavior is not actually acted by the rational animal, but by our irrational evolutionary patterns. And that's why I'm finishing here, that's why I'm studying all this, because it's for me, for an evolutionary biologist who does genomics, it's fascinating to try to understand how this, in only six million years uh, of difference from a common ancestor, how these two very different behaviors might have appeared. And I shut up now, I have other examples, but done. Thank you. So, and now we, our next speaker is Antonio Cabrales. Antonio is professor of economics at the University College of London since uh, last year, since, since 2013. And he's also a research associate of the Center of Economic Policy and um, also professor. Uh, now he's not exactly Only. professor there, but um, of the Department of Economics at the University uh, Carlos III of Madrid. So he receives his BA in economics uh, from the Universidad Complutense, Universi Complutense University of Madrid and his PhD uh, in economics in the, of the University of California, San Diego. His field of research includes game theory, experimental economics, network economics, and mechanisms design. He has a lot of published papers, and his talk today has a very interesting title. So, il, Neuroeconomics, Il Bueno, Il Bruto, Il Cativo, suggesting that neuroeconomics has the potential to embed neuro, digo, economics in the chemical processes taking place in the brain. And in fact, when, when I was writing him today, he was telling me, oh, but I'm not a neuroscientist. Uh, even so, he will speak a lot about neuroscience, you will see. Thank you for coming, okay. Antonio. The Thank you. Um, it's a privilege to be here. Um, we used to run a, a seminar here many years ago called Barcelona Jokes when, when Andreu Mascolel was, uh, was uh, still a scientist rather than a politician. It was, uh, it's a lot of fun to be back here. Um, so I'm talking about first some of the, some of the evidence uh, before doing theory. So it's a mistake to do. In this, I agree with, uh, with uh, Arkady that it's a mistake to do theory before you have some evidence. So let me give you first the evidence, and then I, I have a short discussion on, on potential theories or something. So the first uh, is uh, we're going to talk about four uh, molecules that I think have been studied quite a bit in, uh, in uh, both by economists or psychologists and, and other people of, uh, of bad lives uh, over the few, last few years. And, and the first interesting one is glucose. So the, this, this is a famous experiment. I, you, you might have heard of it in, in the press because it was very striking. 
the first experiment, not experiment, but collection of data from the real world by Danziger, Lebaf, and Avna in Peso, what they did is they checked the decisions of uh, judges that were deciding uh, whether to, to give uh, prisoners to, to release them on, on uh, to release them on probation or not. So after you've done half your sentence, you can be released on bail or not. Uh, and, 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 and then if you behave well during the rest of the time, then you're out and otherwise you, you get back in. So what they, what they, they did is they, they took uh, the, 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 the judges and they looked at the decisions they did just after they arrived, so presumably just after they had breakfast, just before they went for the first break, which was sometime, you know, mid-morning, uh, after the first break, just before lunch, and just after lunch. And, and they have a long discussion in the paper showing that, that in fact, it's very difficult for, I mean, the, the ordering in which the, the courts, I mean, the cases come to them is, is not quite random, but, you know, for most practical purposes, it's random. So it's, a, it's almost a... a